ladies and gentlemen, welcome to CBSBaltimore.com. Welcome Stan White to this side of TV right, Marty, Hill. Marty, Marty. Out of sight. Good you to know see you. Good to see you. We just did a nice coffee with Stan has uh, what I think is an excellent book out about the Baltimore Ravens called If These Walls Could Talk. Um, stories in the locker room, sideline, press box, et cetera. And I mentioned this on here. I'll mention it again because we do want to talk about the book. Then we're going we're gonna to talk football here. Um, it's, you're not talking out of school. You're not betraying confidence. You don't throw anybody under the bus. But there are stories in here that I had never heard, and I've been around it. Uh, and congratulations, I mean, this is, this is good. Well, one of the pleasures of doing the games is you get to go, I go in the locker room after the game, you know, and do interviews after the game. So I'm there during the bad times when Billy Cundiff misses a field goal up in New England and they're done, to the good times when they go up there the next year and beat New England and are going to the Super Bowl. So it's a real dichotomy to go in the, in the locker rooms after a win, after a loss. I get to follow guys when they first come into the league and they're ready to talk anytime and do interviews to later on when uh, they're more famous and they want to get dressed first and then later on when they're really famous and they just want to do it all at one time with all the reporters. So, <laughs> the I, I, yeah, yeah, I get to see the the, uh, the, the progress that they make. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But, but you've got a good body of of media work. I mean, let's face it, you had an incredible pro career. You played on the Baltimore Colts part two. You know, you yeah. got the United Colts, you got the Jones Colts, and I still say you guys don't get the credit you deserve. That was a butt kicking football team. But here's where I'm going with this: these young guys don't care. You're an older guy, you're doing the radio, okay, NFL, PA, they get it, but you had to earn the respect and you have. Oh, yeah. I mean, the fact that you played does, does give you some credibility with the guys, you know. Uh, but, some. Yeah, some. But they want you to know, they want to know what you know about the game now. Because mm -hmm. the game's different than when I played. The rules are different, everything's different. I'm not sure it's better, but it's different. Uh, and uh, uh, so they want, they want you to be able to be able to talk about what's going on now, not, well, that's not the way I did it when, you know, that mm -hmm. stuff, nobody wants to hear that. Uh, I want to keep talking about the book for just a couple seconds, but then we're going to talk about the game now. Um, uh, the, the most fascinating chapters to me are the Art Modell, Steve Bishotti chapters. They're nine and 10, but they kind of blend together because the two men blended together a football team. Does that make sense to you? Well, yes. I mean, was Art it the Modell team or was it the Bishotti team? Yes, Art, Art came with the, t the franchise here. It was one that he didn't want to move, but Cleveland forced him to move. You know, I'm from back there, so I know the, all the stories and the backdrops to everything that happened there. Uh, he moved the team here, but he was still financially strapped. And then Steve came in, put some money into it, and that's when they won the Super Bowl. So it took both of them to do that. And I've known Steve Bishotti for a long time. He used to own a health club right across the street from, from Aerotech, and he would come over there and work out every day. I didn't know him well when he was there, but I still remember him coming over every day, working out, going back to work. So uh, it's good to have a local guy own the football team to uh, go along with, you know, one of the icons of the National Football League, Art Modell, started Monday Night Football. How is he not in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, it's, it's a, because the people in Cleveland are still mad at him. You and, know what? And, and, and they're sore losers, and they're keeping him out of the Hall of Fame. Who, what, where, when, why, and did you have impact? If you are a Clevelander in the media, and you can't get over that, you must excuse yourself from the panel. Yeah, we got over Bob Ursay, didn't we? <laughs> We've gotten over, we gotten over yeah, a lot. But yeah. anyway, let's back to this. But you, you, you show how Steve Bashotti learned from art and listened to other guys around the league who said, play it slow, play it sure. So when you take the reins, you're in the driver's seat. And I think they're the two best chapters in the book. Yeah, it is good. Uh, Steve did a great job, and it was it, it worked out perfectly. Ron Shapiro, who I used to practice law with, it was his advisor, and they went into it, and he, he bought into it, bought half the team, and then he was going to take over. The part of it was for Art Modell, so he could enjoy those last years as an owner team. The other part was for Steve to learn. He knew he had to learn. Too many people buy football teams and think they know it all because they've been successful in another business. And you see with the Buffalo Bills now, uh, other franchises, that just doesn't work. They have to learn how to be owners. Steve did that 
with a timeline, and he's been a great owner ever since he uh, took over. Yeah, he has. I can't recommend this book enough. Um, and you all know me well. I, I will not just sit out here and pimp a product. I, I, there's, there's 40 years of trust I've built up here. These walls could talk. I want to talk. Let's talk current football because, I mean, let's face it, you've been doing the games on radio what, 12, 13 years? 12 years, yeah. 12 years, mm -hmm. you and Jerry are doing a great job. Other folks have been joining the booth this year. Dennis Pitta did a great job. He did. Todd Heap in there as we were doing yep. these, yep. this taping here. Yeah, Todd's a good man. Um, I, got, I saw on Barstool Sports uh, a graph of injuries. Uh, we'll round some numbers here. Mm -hmm. it, at the time of the Super Bowl last year, there were 1,300 significant injuries in the NFL. The vast majority were below the waste. Not all, but the vast majority. Mm -hmm. And what happened last week, we're, we're playing the Steelers. We're making this taping on the 10th of October. Bang, another leg. Bang, another leg. Tell me why this is, Stan. I think it's because there's two, two things that go into it. Number one is they do too much sports-specific training, which means they build muscle groups, overbuild some muscle groups, and underbuild other ones. It used to be everybody played three sports, so they developed all their different muscle groups athletically. I always felt that I was a basketball player, and if I wouldn't have been a basketball player, I don't think I'd have been an NFL football player, because the footwork and seeing the field and knowing when to, to, to break on things, all those different things you learn from different sports. Uh, so I don't think, I think sometimes you overdevelop things and underdevelop the supporting muscles, muscle groups and tendons and ligaments and things. The other is the fields of self. You know, when, when I played, the field was a great equalizer. The weather, you know, the grass, it, was a, it, it slowed you down. Today's fields, every one of them is perfect, every game. If you, you have a dome, you have artificial surface, you have meticulous surfaces, and it just makes every, they're bigger, faster, stronger to start with now, but the fields make them extremely fast, so the collisions are that much greater at the same time and if those supporting muscle groups aren't there to support it that's where you get the injuries I made this analogy a bunch of folks were uh, were watching I made two analogies and I'm gonna bring them up to you I'm a huge NASCAR fan uh, the folks who watch this show know it I can I can bore you to death with NASCAR but the way it works in NASCAR is you bring two cars to the racetrack let's say Jimmy Johnson seven-time champion has a problem and puts his car into the wall Back in the day, they get out the backup car. We hope it's as good. BS now, he gets in that second car. He won't know the difference between that and the first. Technology, in, yes. It, mm -hmm. they're, they're equal, they're identical, same horsepower, same everything. Mm -hmm. In football these days, do you need two number one teams? Not, not, not the next guy up. Do you need literally two number one teams? Well, you would like to have that, but nobody does. There's a reason why one guy's on the first team and one guy's on the second team. But as you point out here, sometimes that person on the second team just has not gotten the opportunity. And he gets in there and he ends up being better than the guy he replaced. You hope that happens. It doesn't happen very often, but I've seen it happen many different times. I think it's more important now in the NFL than ever before. You talk about Jared Johnson, you know, he, he was a backup defensive lineman, a backup inside linebacker. They needed him to play outside linebacker. They put him in there. And it turns out he's one of the better outside linebackers the Ravens have ever had. Yeah, exactly correct. Now, another NASCAR analogy. At the big super speedways, Daytona, Talladega, they restrict those engines. <laughs> Is it to the point in football, you just mentioned guys are big. They're mm -hmm. almost bigger than their own bodies can handle. Do we need to put down some kind of your weight cannot exceed, your muscle mass cannot exceed. No, Is it coming? I wouldn't do that. I mean, but what the fields are, because everybody's getting bigger, faster, and stronger, so it's, there, there's not an imbalance there. If you look at the average sizes of one team against the other, there's not an imbalance. But you remember we played Miami in the preseason? and it was the field was all mushy and wet. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no injuries in that game because it slowed everybody down, mm. you know? So uh, to me, like I said, oh. the fields, maybe you gotta do something in the fields to slow people down because of the contact. You can't make it where they're going maximum speed with maximum size 
and maximum muscle groups and put it all together and wow. expect injuries not to happen. That is, a, as Jim Rome would say, that is a great take. I've never heard that before. Yeah. So the field well, has to be less perfect. Yeah. Well, because I remember when I played, you w if you're on defense, you wanted it to rain mm -hmm. because it really slowed the offense down to my speed, which mm -hmm. was less than their speed, okay. obviously. Yeah. So it, it uh, and then, you know, if you're moving slower, the impacts are not quite as hard. Let's talk to Joe Flacco for a second. In this book, here's a great analogy. Joe Cool maybe doesn't fire the team up enough. Maybe it doesn't pump the fans up enough. And someone said to you, that was the profile of Johnny Unitas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Maureen Kilcullen, who uh, was worked for the Colts at that time and now works for, uh, for the Alumni Association, Bruce Laird's group, and the fourth and goal. And she texts me all the time when the people say that about, about Joe Flacco. That's the same thing they said about Johnny Unitas. You know, he was sort of stoic. You know, didn't show. Now, Johnny would get upset every once in a while, and I'm sure Joe does in his own way. But the big players know fakes. And if Joe tried to fake it and, and go start yelling, they would, they would almost start laughing at that point because that's not him. He has to be who he is. And to his credit, he's always been who he is, despite the fact that a lot of fans don't want him to be that way. They want him to be somebody else. But look at his record. I mean, we talked about, I grew up around the Cleveland Browns. How much would they give for a Joe Flacco oh. record on their team? You know, they've had how about like, 20-some quarterbacks since they've, uh, since they've rejoined the league. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ravens have had like two, you know, and Joe Flacco has won a Super Bowl, been to three AFC championship games, been to the playoffs, you know, six, seven times. What would Cleveland, how much would they pay somebody to do that in that town? Yeah. Look, before Tyrod, what would the Bills have paid to yeah. start naming the teams? So my impression of Flacco, and I, sometimes I get frustrated with him. I'm a fan. I sit up in <laughs> Section 540 and I listen to you guys on radio. But he seems to, okay, so you, you, you lose this week. Well, I'm already thinking about next week, that it's, an, that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. I think he gets that. Oh, yeah. It's a week-to-week -week game. I was uh, interviewing John Harbaugh in the locker room after this Oakland game. And the first thing he said, you know, because I'm not surprised that they're 3-2 and two at this point, but I'm surprised how they got there. I thought they would beat Cleveland, Jacksonville, and of the game in Cincinnati, the game in Oakland, and Pittsburgh at home, I thought Pittsburgh at home would be the best chance to win that. Mm -hmm. So they went on they went in cincinnati they went in oakland and it just shows you each week is a different week in this league and i think flacco gets it oh yeah yeah and you have to be that way if you are if you think you're so good after a great game it's going to affect your next game if you get down on yourself after a bad game it's going to affect the next game you just have to go on and play the next game interesting Another quick question. Do you want to jump in? Because I could. Well, I'm just, you said a, you started putting this together a year ago, and yes. you were hesitant to do it. Only because I knew it was going to take a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. you know? And like I said, I coach a high school team. I do the Ravens. I have nine grandchildren. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a one in college. So it's all those different things. He's playing basketball at Stanford, so I want to go to some of their games. So it, all these different things in my life. Uh, but uh, Jeff Seidel has been a longtime friend of mine uh, in the broadcasting business, and he was going through cancer at the time. And I, th and I know he really wanted to do this, so uh, I wanted to do it not because, just because I had a, uh, I use the word unique, I hate to use the word unique about yourself, but okay. uh, insight to this, uh, but also for Jeff, because it was something that would help him get through his treatments, uh, doing this, uh, uh, you know, at that time in his life. And now so. how do you feel with the process? Was it what you expected? Uh, yeah, I think it was what I expected. Mm -hmm. I mean, those guys did a lot of the work. They interviewed me, and then they transcribed that and then turned it into chapters, and then I would write a few chapters here and there. So th they did most of the hard work, which was, which was good. <laughs> yeah, the, hard, the hard work was the sweat equity that you put into being able to sit down and say, now here's what happened. Uh, yeah. Don't yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're being humble on this, and I respect that. But the fact of the matter is, was your sweat equity that made this book happen. I'm telling you, I'm loving this. There's a chapter on Matt Stover, which was going to be my next, uh, I just want to get into your brain on this one. I understand why Jan Stanarud is in the Hall of Fame. Yes. Because he changed the game. He did. 
and did you have impact? Could you single-handedly change a game? I think that is for any Hall of Fame. I think that should be the, the number one criteria. Michael Jordan is in the game, is in the Hall of Fame, because Michael Jordan could single-handedly change a game. Right. I'm using the biggest example I, yep. I could. But a guy like Stover, a guy like Tucker, uh, Denitari, uh Janikowski, how are these guys not in or will never be considered from the Hall of Fame? What is the problem there? Well, kickers are sort of a different animal. And, uh, you know, when they make kicks, they're football players. When they don't, they're not football players. You know, it, it, it's just the, the, the way it's always been. And they're, you know, they're strange dudes usually. You know, they're a little different. And you have to be to live under that pressure all the time. Uh, so I was actually a kicker in college. I set two records. I made the most extra points in one year, really? and I missed the most extra points in one year. Oh. So after that, all I did was kick off. But uh, I know the pressure. I was kicking in front of 90,000 people. You were kicking in front of Woody Hayes. Yeah, it, yes. That was even worse than the 90,000 people because he, he would, you know what Woody would do. He, he'd smack you upside the head if you missed one. So, uh, yeah, so I know the pressure. And it, so they're, they're different, different animals. Back when... Back in the old days, the kickers were, played a position. Lou Groza was an offensive tackle, Lou the Toe Groza. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the soccer guys started to come along, and they, the soccer kickers, and guys didn't think, well, they're not really football players, they're soccer guys. And, and so, it, now, Morton Anderson's going to the Hall of Fame this year. You know, he went in this year. So there's another kicker exactly in the correct. Hall of Fame with, with Jan Stenerud. But you look at Stenerud, he made like 67% of his kicks. You get cut now. If you made that, wow. yeah, yeah, you get cut would have now. Cut. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Because Tucker's making around ninety percent for his career, and he's the all-time leader. And Stover right up there. Yeah, Stover's right up there too, and you know Stover played like twenty years, so you got to give him credit wow. for what he did, and he kept the Ravens for that Super Bowl run, the first one when they didn't score a touchdown in five straight games. He kept them in the mix all those games. They wouldn't have won the Super Bowl without Matt Stover. Yeah, did. Hey, listen, we could go on forever and ever, but I know you've got some things you've got to do. Um, great book. If these walls could talk, Baltimore Ravens, Stan White, always, uh, don't see enough, always great to uh, see you. And great work on those Ravens broadcasts. I mean that. Well, I appreciate it, Marty. And one final thing, uh, I think a way people could use this book, the way I used the book called The History of the Baltimore Colts that John Steadman, old friend of yours, mm -hmm. uh, wrote. Uh, it has a lot of pictures in here. I kept this book with me wherever I went, and I had all the old Colts sign it. Lenny Moore, Gino Marchetti, Alan Amici, uh, you know, Artie Donovan, Johnny Nice, all those guys, Burt Jones, Roger Carr, all the way down, Ted Hendricks, Mike Curtis. Yeah. It, it's a great it's a history here to have, but it can also be a memento mm -hmm. by having all those guys sign, sign that and it. keep mm -hmm. it in one place. That's yeah. not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. All right, Bubba. All right. You see here, got the Bears coming in. I got a great, I was telling this to Lynn. Tell Stan what I said we should do on the air. Drinking game. For every time someone says... <laughs> The Bears? Every time somebody dub goes, Dub Bears. Dub Bears. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. We're doing this the on... The old commercial with, yeah, Mike did <laughs> yeah, um, Dub Bears. We're doing this one on a Tuesday. I told Lynn on the air, I said, I said, if you turned it into a drinking game, this town would have a hangover by Thursday. <laughs> yeah, they would. They would. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for stopping by. CBSBaltimore.com.